Hello, my dear students. Today's lecture is about the descending tracts of spinal cord, the corticospinal tracts that consist of an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. After this, I'll talk about the extrapyramidal tracts, the tectospinal tract, the rubrospinal tract, olivospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, and the vestibulospinal tracts. I will explain their mechanism of action and anatomy step by step. You will get to know how the extrapyramidal tracts facilitate the functioning of the pyramidal tracts. Hope you will understand well and your concepts will be clear and strong. At the end, I will request for channel subscription, likes and comments. So let's start our lecture now. Nervous system is morphologically divided into central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system consists of brain and the spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is the 12 cranial nerves coming out of the brain and 31 spinal nerves coming out of the spinal cord. Both the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves can have ganglia and the plexus. So all this will be the part of peripheral nervous system. And now the functional classification of the nervous system. The nervous system function can be motor or it can be sensory. When it's motor, it's the job of the effectors. And when it's sensory, it's the job of the receptors. The effector has got two categories. The two categories are the voluntary effectors and the involuntary effectors. Voluntary effectors belong to the somatic nervous system and involuntary effectors belong to the visceral nervous system. Voluntary effectors are the skeletal muscle while the involuntary effectors are the smooth muscle, the cardiac muscle and the glands. Likewise, receptors has got two categories. The receptors can be exterior receptors when they belong to the somatic nervous system and the factors can be interior receptors when they belong to the visceral nervous system. So we get four functions of the nervous system. Two are the categories of the motor and two are the categories of the sensory. These four are general functions and we give them a code. The skeletal muscle function is labeled as the general somatic efferent. This involuntary effectors, the function is labeled as the general visceral efferent. The function of exterior receptor is labeled as the general somatic efferent and function of the interior receptors is labeled as the general visceral efferent. How we name these components, the detail is given in my lecture about the spinal cord components. The link is available in the description for performing this function of the skeletal muscle. Now system has got descending tracts that supply the nerve supply to these skeletal muscles. For the general visual efferent, the tracts are known as the autonomic nervous system and for this general somatic afferent component, the tracts are known as the ascending tracts. The lecture about the ascending tracts and the autonomic system I have already recorded and is available on my channel and the link is given in the description. Today I will talk about in detail about the descending tracts that deal with the skeletal muscle and the code is the general somatic efferent. Now we know that descending tracts deal with the skeletal muscles and this function is known as the general somatic efferent. For these functions, these tracts the origin is the frontal lobe, the cerebral cortex. In this lobe, the gyrus is known as the precentral gyrus. And according to Broadman, this area is labeled as area 46. From here, the neurons will start and their destination is the skeletal muscles of the body. But the question is, how many neurons? And the answer is for this function we require two neurons and these two neurons are labeled as the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron.
Now the classification of the descending tracks. The classification of the descending tracks is different from the classification of the ascending tracks. In the ascending tracks, we have got different categories and in different categories, we distribute specific functions. And each category of the ascending tract is responsible for that functions. In descending tracts, we first divide these tracts into two categories, pyramidal tracts and the extra pyramidal tracts. The pyramidal tract is the corticospinal tract and extra pyramidal tracts are the rubrospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, olivospinal tract, tactospinal tract and the vestibulospinal tract. In these two categories, we don't divide the functions. In fact, the corticospinal tract is the master tract. It has got direct access to all the skeletal muscles. It is responsible for the actions of the skeletal muscles. So we can label this tract as the master tract, corticospinal tract. But what is the role of the extrapyramidal tract? What function they will perform? The extrapyramidal tract are there for improving the accuracy and precision of the action that is performed by the corticospinal tract. The extrapyramidal tract has got some important information about the tone of the muscles, about the balance of the body, about the position of the joints. So with this information, they improvise the actions that are performed by the corticospinal tract. The extrapyramidal tract don't have direct access to the skeletal muscles. The extrapyramidal tract has got access only to the corticospinal tract. I will explain shortly how the extrapyramidal tract works. Pyramidal tract, corticospinal tract. I'll talk about its basic anatomy. The basic anatomy is that it consists of two neurons and the neurons are upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Upper motor neuron, the destination is low motor neuron and the lower motor neuron, destination is the skeletal muscle. The best way to study neural anatomy is that you should know where is the cell body. Where is the cell body of the upper motor neuron and where is the cell body of lower motor neuron. The upper motor neuron cell body is present in the primary motor cortex that is area 4. It is also present in the premotor cortex that is area 6. We can also say motor cortex area 4, 6. The interesting thing is that the motor neurons, upper motor neuron on cell body is also present in the sensory cortex. In fact, the upper motor neuron on cell body are present in these three areas in equal ratio. 33% of the cell bodies are present in the premotor cortex area 6. 33% of the cell bodies are present in the primary motor cortex that is area 4 and 33% of the cell bodies are present in the primary somatosensory area that is area 312. This area has got a special name sensory motor cortex because the origin is both from the motor cortex as well as the sensory cortex. From here these neurons will descend and keep in mind they will not just descend they will cross the site if they are coming from the right side, they will go to the left side of the spinal cord and if they are coming from left side, they will go to the right side of the spinal cord. And in the spinal cord, they will end at the lower motor neuron. The lower motor neuron cell body is present in the ventral horn. Here we have got the lower motor neuronal cell body. From here, the lower motor neuron will exit the spinal cord through the ventral root of the spinal cord. Ventral root is pure motor. It has got only the lower motor neurons fibers and these lower motor neurons will reach the destination that is the skeletal muscle. For the destination they may utilize the plexus like the brachial plexus, lumbar plexus or the lumbosacral plexus. So this is the basic anatomy of the pyramidal tract corticospinal tract. It consists of two neurons upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Lower motor neuronal cell bodies are equally present in the premotor cortex primary motor cortex and the primary somatosensory area. From here the pomotor neuron will descend, will cross to the opposite side and will reach the destination that is the low motor neuron present in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And the low motor neuron will exit the central nervous system, will come out of the central nervous system and will reach the destination that is the skeletal muscle. So this is the basic anatomy of the pyramidal tract. 
Now I will add up more tricky points, more details about this track. Motor homunculus. What does motor homunculus mean? This is the representation of the body or the primary motor cortex that is the precentral gyrus present in the frontal lobe. The important detail about the body representation of the motor homunculus is sequence of the body parts and the size of the area that each body part will get over this motor homunculus. First the sequence. The cerebral cortex has got a medial surface and has got a supralateral surface. Over the medial surface, we have got the representation of the foot and the lower limb. And then over the supralateral surface, first comes the trunk, then comes the upper limb, then comes the hand, and then comes the face. And close to the lateral circles, over the supralateral surface, we have got the representation of the tongue, pharynx, and the larynx. So this is the sequence of the body parts that are present over the motor homunculus. Now come to the size. The size of the body part over the motor homunculus depends upon the complexity of the movement. More the complexity of movement of a body part, more it will have a area over the motor homunculus. Complexity of movement means how much that part is involved in the skilled voluntary activities. This is the area of the hand. Hand is involved in our majority of the skilled motor activity throughout the day. And this is the area of the trunk that is not much involved in skilled motor activities. So the hand has got a larger surface area over the motor homunculus and trunk has got a lesser surface area over the motor homunculus. So this is the rule that will decide how much an area will be given to the body part over the motor homunculus. Understanding the motor homunculus will also help us in understanding the cardiovascular accident. This diagram shows that this part of the motor homunculus that is related with the lower limb is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. So if there is block in the anterior cerebral artery, this will lead to the paralysis of uh, this body part. After that, the rest of the body, this whole area has got the arterial supply from the middle cerebral artery. So when the middle cerebral artery is locked, this part of the body will be affected or Paralyzed. So this is all about the motor homunculus. In this diagram, I will show you how the pyramidal tract will descend and how it will have two categories that is the lateral corticospinal tract and the anterior corticospinal tract. This is the coronal section of the cerebral hemisphere. We have got the thalamus here and here is the basal nuclei. Between the thalamus and the basal nuclei, we have got a narrow passage. This narrow passage is for the descending fibers and this narrow passage is known as the internal capsule. And this is the motor cortex present over the surface of the cerebral hemisphere. In this motor cortex, we have got the neuronal cell bodies of the upper motor neuron. And the shape of this neuronal cell body is pyramidal. Hence the name of the tract is pyramidal tract. The upper motor neuron will descend from here but first they will converge as they have to pass through a narrow passage that is the internal capsule between the thalamus and the basal nuclei. Crossing the internal capsule, the fibers will reach the brain stem that consists of midbrain, pons and medulla. So the fibers will descend and will reach the medulla. Here 75 to 90 percent of the fibers will cross to the opposite side. The tract on the right side will move towards the left side and track on the left side will move towards the right side. This cross is at the level of the medulla and is named as the motor decussation. After crossing, these fibers will reach the spinal cord and in the spinal cord, location of this fiber is the lateral white column. These fibers will descend in the spinal cord and location of this fiber is the lateral white column. Hence the name of this tract that has crossed to the opposite side and descend in the spinal cord lateral white right column. The name will be lateral corticospinal tract. The remaining fiber that hasn't crossed that is 10 to 25 percent of the fibers will descend as it is and will reach the spinal cord. In the spinal cord they will have a location over the anterior white right column. So they will descend in the anterior white right column. Hence, the name of this tract will be anterior corticospinal tract. 
both the tracks will descend until a neuron finds its lower motor neuron. That neuron will exit the track and will synapse with the low motor neuron present in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. The low motor neuron will exit the spinal cord through the ventral root and will move towards the skeletal muscle it has to supply. Likewise, the fibers in the anterior corticospinal tract will descend and when they will find their low motor neuron, they will first cross to the opposite side at that segment level. Then the low motor neuron will move out of the spinal cord through the ventral root and will move towards the skeletal muscle it has to supply. So, we can note down here the anterior corticospinal tract will also cross to the opposite side but at the spinal cord segment level. It will not cross in the medulla, it will cross at the level of the spinal cord segment. So, this is how the pyramidal tracts will descend and will have two categories the lateral corticospinal tract and the anterior corticospinal tract. Now I'll talk about the pyramidal tract terminology. The pyramidal tract when it descends through different parts of the brain, it crosses midbrain, bones and medulla. And in each region it has got a specific site and the specific name of that site. So let me talk about those specific sites and the specific terminologies. The upper motor neurons from here will descend and will have to converge from a narrow passage that is present between the thalamus and the basal nuclei. This narrow passage is known as the internal capsule. Before the internal capsule, this web of fibers, this is known as the corona radiata. After the internal capsule comes the midbrain and in the midbrain, these fibers has got a region on the anterior aspect of the midbrain. This part of the midbrain is known as the crus cerebri. After the midbrain comes the pons and in the pons again these fibers has got a location on the anterior aspect of the pons and this part of the pons is known as the basis pontis. After the pons come medulla and all the fibers are relatively more compact in the medulla and they make appearance in the medulla anterior aspect. This appearance is known as the pyramids. After the middle the pyramids, 75 to 90 percent of the fibers will cross to the opposite side and will descend in the spinal cord lateral white column here. So this is the lateral corticospinal tract. 10 to 25 percent of the fibers will not cross to the opposite side. They will descend as it is and will be present in the anterior white column of the spinal cord. So this part of the tract will be known as the anterior corticospinal tract. So, in this way, the pyramidal tract will have different names in different regions. This hole is a pyramidal tract, but when it is in the telencephalon, it is named as the corona radiata. When it passes between thalamus and basal nuclei, the name is the internal capsule. When it passes through the midbrain, the name is the crus cerebri. When it passes through the pons, name is the basis pontis. And when it passes through the medulla, the name is the pyramids. After the medulla, the track has got two deviants. Either it is present in the lateral white column of the spinal cord as lateral corticospinal tract or it is present in the anterior white column of the spinal cord as the anterior corticospinal tract. Look at this diagram. This diagram shows us the cross features of the anterior aspect of the brain stem. This is the crest cerebri. This is the basis pontis and this prominence is the medullary pyramids. We can note down when the pyramid tract will descend through the brain stem, it will be present on the anterior parts of midbrain, bones and the medulla. So this is all about the pyramidal tract terminologies. Now I will explain an important concept that how much the upper motor neuron will descend. This is the motor cortex, here we have got the pyramidal tract. This pyramidal tract will cross to the opposite side in the medulla and then this pyramidal tract will descend in the spinal cord white matter. This pyramidal tract has got neurons that are only the upper motor neuron. So you can note down that the pyramidal tract consists of neurons that consist of only the upper motor neuron. And the question is how much the neurons will descend in the pyramidal tract. Before giving you the answer, let me explain this diagram first. 
In the region of neck, the cervical nerves make a plexus. The root value is C1 to C4 and this plexus will supply the muscles of neck. And below the cervical plexus, we have got the brachial plexus whose root value is C5678 T1 and this plexus will supply the upper limb. Then in the lumbar region, we have got the plexus of nerves again. This root value is L1 to L5 and then below the lumbar plexus, we have got the lumbosacral plexus whose root value is L45 S123. Both of these plexus are there for supplying the skeletal muscles of lower limb. So now the answer, how much the upper motor neuron will descend? The answer is upper motor neuron will descend until it founds its low motor neuron that is present in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. For example, an upper motor neuron whose destination is to supply the skeletal muscles of the neck, it will descend in the tract till the upper cervical segments. Here it will move out of the tract and will synapse with the low motor neuron present in that segment and the lower motor neuron will move towards the skeletal muscles of the neck passing through the cervical plexus. Likewise, there is an upper motor neuron whose destination is the muscles of upper limb. This neuron will descend till the spinal cord segments that form the brachial plexus. In those segments, these fibers will move out of the tract and will synapse with the low motor neuron present in that spinal cord segment. And the low motor neuron then move out of the spinal cord and then move towards this target that is skeletal muscles of the upper limb passing through the brachial plexus. And an upper motor neuron that has to supply the muscles of the lower limb will descend in the pyramidal tract till the lumbar and the sacral segments. In these segments, it will move out of the tract and will synapse with the lower motor neuron in that segment. The lower motor neuron will move out of the spinal cord and will supply the lower limb skeletal muscles passing through the lumbar plexus or the lumbosacral plexus. Here comes an important fact. In the region of the cranium, we have got skeletal muscles. We have got the muscles of the brachial arches. For supplying these muscles, upper motor neuron is present in the pyramidal tract and this upper motor neuron will descend and it will synapse with the low motor neuron and the low motor neuron will supply the muscles of the cranium. So how much this neuron is going to descend? I will explain at the end of this lecture. Now I'll talk about the skeletal muscle neurons. First the type of the neurons. The neurons can be afferent neurons or an efferent neuron. Afferent neuron is a sensory neuron that sends information from receptor to the central nervous system. Efferent neuron is a motor neuron that sends information or an order from the CNS to the effectors. Skeletal muscle is a voluntary effector. Now look at here. You know a skeletal muscle cell is known as a fiber. One skeletal muscle cell is one fiber. In the skeletal muscle, there are two types of fibers. The fiber can be intrafusal fiber or it can be extrafusal fiber. You know in the skeletal muscle, we have got the receptors that are known as the muscle spindle. In the muscle spindle, there are skeletal muscle fibers that are capsulated. So we name these fibers as the intrafusal fibers. These intrafusal fibers play the role of the receptor and they convey information about the muscle joint sense, rate of change of length to the central nervous system. This information is also known as the proprioception. Outside these capsulated intrafusal fibers, all other fibers are known as the extrafusal fibers. That is actually the majority of the skeletal muscle. The job of these extrafusal fibers is only to contract. Now coming to the neuron fibers that will supply these skeletal muscle, intrafusal fibers and the extrafusal fibers. You know, we have got the pyramidal tract that descends in the spinal cord white matter. And this pyramidal tract has got the upper motor neurons. These upper motor neurons will move out of the tract and will synapse with the low motor neuron in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. Now this low motor neuron will move out of the ventral root and will supply the skeletal muscle. You know the lower motor neuron is of two types. A lower motor neuron that supplies the extrafusal fibers is known as the alpha motor neuron. There is a second type of the lower motor neuron that is present in the ventral horn. It moves out of the spinal cord and then its target is the 
intrafusal fibers. The second category of the low motor neuron is known as the gamma motor neuron. So we have got two types of the low motor neurons, alpha motor neuron and the gamma motor neuron. Here you can also note down that the upper motor neuron of the pyramidal tract, corticospinal tract has got direct connection with the alpha motor neuron and they don't have a direct connection with the gamma motor neuron. I will explain this point shortly when I will talk about the extra pyramidal tracts. Also note down the alpha and the gamma motor neuron both belong to the type A category of the fibers. Now the sensory or the afferent neuron that convey information from the receptor to the central nervous system. These neurons belong to the posterior white column tract. These neurons will ascend in the posterior white column till the medulla where they will found second order neuron known as the gracile and the cuneate nucleus. The detail about the posterior white column tract is present in my other lecture of the sending tract. The link is present in the description below. So this is all about the skeletal muscle neurons. Skeletal muscle has got two type of the fibers and it has got two type of the neurons, afferent neurons and efferent neurons. And the efferent neurons further has got two categories, alpha and gamma motor neurons. Now we will study the extrapyramidal tracts. The extrapyramidal tract is formed by the structures that are present inside the brain that have got important information about the balance of the body, about the muscle tone, about the position of the joint. And this information is important for the precise functioning of the pyramidal tract, corticospinal tract. Before going to the detail of the extrapyramidal tract, first let me show you what I have drawn in this diagram. This is the pyramidal tract. Here we have got the midbrain, pons and medulla and outside midbrain, pons and medulla we have got the cerebellum and below the medulla this we have got the spinal cord. Now the structures that are going to perform the function of the extra pyramidal tract or those structures that have got important motor information about the muscles and joint. So first of all this is the basal nuclei that consists of caudate, putamen and the lentiform nucleus. Then there is a nucleus in the midbrain that has got important motor information. This nucleus is known as the superior colliculus. This is the part of the tectum. In the pons, there is a nucleus that has got important motor information. This nucleus is known as the red nucleus. Then in the medulla, there are two nuclei. One is the inferior olivary nucleus and other is the lateral vestibular nucleus. The last structure that will perform the function of the extrapyramidal tract is the reticular formation and reticular formation is group of scattered nuclei, scattered neurons all over the midbrain, pons and medulla. This is the reticular formation that will also play a role in the extrapyramidal tract. Let's suppose this is the ventral grey horn and ventral grey horn has got lower motor neurons and lower motor neurons are of two categories. There is a lower motor neuron known as the alpha motor neuron that will supply the extra fusal fibers involved in contraction. And there is a low motor neuron that will supply the intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindle. This low motor neuron is the gamma motor neuron. In the pyramidal tract here, you know, we have got the upper motor neurons. The upper motor neuron's destination is the lower motor neuron that is the alpha motor neuron. Now the question is how the extra pyramidal tract will interact with the pyramidal tract. How these structures will send information to the pyramidal tract. For this function, you know, all of these nuclei has got neurons that will descend. And how much they will descend? These neurons will descend till this ventral grey horn. Here these neurons will get connection with the gamma motor neuron that is a direct connection and they will get connection with the alpha motor neuron also but that is an indirect connection. So in this way we can say that extra pyramidal tract has got connection with the alpha motor neuron as well as the gamma motor neuron. Now we will study each of the extra pyramidal tract one by one. What is their function and what are their nuclei? First of all the tectospinal tract. For this we have got the superior colliculus part of the tectum in the midbrain. This superior colliculus has got connection with the visual pathways. Here we have got a neuron that will descend. It will cross to the opposite side and then will descend and reach the ventral grey horn. Here this neuron will have direct connection with the gamma motor neuron and an indirect connection with the alpha motor neuron. 
This neuron is going to influence only a part of the corticospinal tract that controls the movements of our neck. This tract is related with the reflex postural movements concerning the sight. For example, when we want to look at a light source, suddenly our neck should also move in coordination. And this reflex is known as the reflex postural movement related with the sight. And this is the job of the, this coordination is the job of the tactospinal tract. Now the rubrospinal tract. Rubrospinal tract, the nucleus is the red nucleus present in the pons. From here, an neuron will come out. It will cross to the opposite side and will descend till the ventral gray horn where it will have synapse with the gamma motor neuron and a synapse with the alpha motor neuron. The rubrospinal tract has got connection with the corticospinal tract at all the levels of the spinal cord segments. The rubrospinal tract activity will facilitate the flexors of our body and will inhibit the extensors of our body. And you know when flexors are facilitated and extensors are inhibited, this means that we are in a functional posture. Majority of the functions that we perform in our life we are in a relaxed posture and we are in a flexed posture. So the rubrospinal tract is responsible for this activity. Now the vestibulospinal tract. You know we have got a lateral vestibular nucleus that is present in the medulla. This lateral vestibular nucleus has got information from our ear. And in the ear we have got the receptors for balance that is the utricle, saccule and the semicircular canals. This information is also coordinated to the cerebellum and information from both of these tracts is present in the lateral vestibular nucleus. So a neuron will move out of this nucleus, will not cross to the opposite side and will reach the ventral gray horn. Here it will have synapse with the alpha motor neuron and an indirect synapse with the gamma motor neuron. The role of this vestibulospinal tract is to facilitate the actions of the extensor muscles and inhibit the activity of the flexor muscle. This is opposite to the actions of the rubrospinal tract. And imagine when we are going to activate our extensors and inhibit our flexors, it's a balanced posture. If we want to prevent any fall, we'll adopt that posture. We will activate our extensors and we will inhibit our flexors. So this is the job of the vestibulospinal tract. Now the olivospinal tract that is related with the inferior olivary nucleus present in the middle law. Note down that this inferior olivary nucleus has got input from the basal nuclei, it has got input from the red nucleus and it has got input from the motor cortex. So it has got much information about the motor activities. So a neuron will come out of this inferior olivary nucleus, will cross to the opposite side and will reach the ventral gray horn where it will have synapse with the alpha motor neuron and a gamma motor neuron. The oligospinal tract is going to influence the corticospinal tract at all the spinal cord segments. And the function of this oligospinal tract is it is going to influence the activity of motor neurons in the anterior gray horn. Now the reticular spinal tract whose neurons are scattered throughout the brain stem. So this is the reticular spinal tract. Neurons will come out of this reticular tract. Some will cross and descend and some will only descend. So this is the reticular spinal tract and these neurons will read the ventral gray horn, the synapse with the gamma motor neuron and will synapse with the alpha motor neuron. The function of this reticular spinal tract is that it is going to influence the corticospinal tract at all the spinal cord segments. It is going to facilitate the voluntary movements of the corticospinal tract. It is going to facilitate the autonomic nervous system. It is going to influence the pregignanic neurons present in the spinal cord. So it is going to regulate the activities of the autonomic nervous system. This is the spinal cord cross section. And in this diagram, I show you where the descending tracks will travel, will descend in the spinal cord. First of all, there is the corticospinal tract, lateral corticospinal tract as it is present in the lateral white column. Below this lateral corticospinal tract, we have got the rubrospinal tract. 
Remaining tracks, rest of the tracks are present in the anterior white column. This one is the reticulospinal tract and anterior to it is the vestibulospinal tract. Medial to vestibulospinal tract, we have got the olivospinal tract. And medial to olivospinal tract is the tectospinal tract. And this one that is present most midly in the anterior white column is the anterior corticospinal tract. So this is the location of the descending tract in the spinal cord. This is my next lecture about the working of the descending spinal cord tracts. This is about stretch reflex, about muscle spindle and how these tracts coordinate the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. How the pyramidal and extrapyramidal tract coordinate and what is the role of the posterior white column tract. This is my next lecture. This lecture will be uploaded very soon. Now look at here, I'll talk about the very special part of pyramidal tract that supplies the muscles of the cranium like the muscles present in the orbit, muscles of the facial expression, muscles of the pharynx and larynx, muscles of the tongue, these are the muscles of the cranium. For these muscles, the upper motor neurons are present in the same pyramidal tract and the lower motor neuron is present in the brain stem as a nuclei. So these upper motor neurons will not cross the brain stem, will not enter the spinal cord. They have their low motor neuron in the brain stem. So we cannot name these upper motor neurons as the corticospinal fibers. We will name these fibers as corticonuclear fibers or the corticobulbar fibers. So these upper motor neurons will exit the pyramidal tract and will synapse with the low motor neuron and then low motor neuron will move towards the destination. These corticonuclear type of fibers are going to serve two type of the cranial nerve component. One is the general somatic efferent component. One is the special visceral efferent component. General somatic efferent component means the skeletal muscles and special visceral efferent component means the brachial arch muscles. The general somatic efferent skeletal muscles are the muscles of the eyeball that moves the eyeball known as the extraocular muscles and the muscles of the tongue. So these two are the general somatic efferent effectors and special visceral efferent effectors are the brachial arch muscles. Brachial arch 1 muscles are the muscles of mastication. Brachial arch 2 muscles are the muscles of facial expression and brachial arch 3, 4 and 6 are the muscles of palate, pharynx and larynx. First I will label these uh, nuclei in the brainstem then I will show you the proper pathway. So this is the oculomotor nucleus present in the midbrain and this nucleus belongs to the cranial nerve number 3. Upper motor neuron is present in the pyramidal tract. This neuron will exit synapse with the low motor neuron and target of the low motor neuron is the extraocular muscles. This one is the trochlear nucleus that is related with the cranial nerve number 4. Upper motor neuron, upper motor neuron will be present in the pyramidal tract. It will exit and synapse with the low motor neuron and target of low motor neuron is same the extraocular muscles. This one is the abducent nucleus present in the pons and related with the cranial nerve number 6. So the upper motor neuron will exit the pyramidal tract and will synapse with the low motor neuron and the target of this neuron is same the extraocular muscles. Now this one. This is the facial nucleus. This belongs to the facial nerve, cranial nerve number 7. Upper motor neuron will descend in the pyramidal tract, will exit the pyramidal tract in the pons and will synapse with the low motor neuron here. And the target of the low motor neuron is the muscles of the facial expression, muscles of the face, forehead and the neck. And these muscles are the muscles of brachial arch 2nd, brachial arch 2. This one here is the masticatory nucleus. This belongs to the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve number 5. So upper motor neuron will descend in the pyramidal tract, will exit and synapse with the low motor neuron here and target of the low motor neuron is the muscles of mastication. This one is the ambiguous nucleus and this ambiguous nucleus is present in the medulla and this is going to serve cranial nerve number 9, 10 and 11. The upper motor neuron present in the pyramidal tract will descend and will synapse with the low motor neuron in the nucleus ambiguous here and low motor neuron will move out of here 
and will move towards the muscles of palate, muscles of pharynx, and the muscles of larynx. So this is the nucleus ambiguous. This last here is the hypoglossal nucleus present in the medulla. Upper motor neuron is present in the pyramidal tract, will reach the nucleus synapse here and low motor neuron will move towards the destination that is the skeletal muscles of the tongue. So all these are the corticonuclear fibers. Their destination is the brainstem nuclei that belong to the cranial nerve component, channel somatic efferent and special visceral efferent. So this is all about the descending tracts.